Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Tactical Coaching Masterclass. Thank you for joining us. Terrific to see such a huge crowd. This is awesome. Um, for those of you who haven't joined any of our previous webinars, my name is Caitlin Ziegler. Uh, I'm a director at GRIST, and I'm going to be your MC for today. But I'm, I'm sharing the MC role with my uh, colleague, Kate Golby, who's our Senior Behavioural Analyst at GRIST. And we have a special guest today, uh, Mike Dunn, who is another director at GRIST and also a senior uh, consultant. Now, um, I'm going to introduce Mike in a second, but just before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, so we really encourage you to submit some questions as we go through, and you can see in your screen there, if you haven't used Teams before, there's the functions to do it. You've got your chat function. You can raise your hand if you've got any issues, um, but please use that chat function to post your questions and we'll get to those right at the end. It is going to be a bit of a Q&A, oh, fairly informal process uh, today, and we will have a look at those um, the questions once we get through to the end of the session. All right, uh, let's get into it. So our special guest today is Mike Dunn, um, and we have a, a running joke here at Grist that if anyone could start a cult, it would be Mike. Uh, fortunately, if anyone who's ever worked with him will attest, Mike is only has only ever used his powers for good, which is great, and he's certainly a, a terrific facilitator when we talk about coaching and we talk about mindset, which is what we're going to talk about today. Um, before joining Grist, Mike was recognised as a high-performing sales consultant at Leader and Leader, and it's this sort of first-hand experience combined with his love of yeah, psychology oh no, sorry, that you can just. Still hear me? I'm not sure what's going on there. Oh, uh, sorry, guys. Can I get everybody to just go on mute? Okay? Yeah, sorry. At this my... All right. All good. <laughs> Technical difficulties continue. Um, but it's this love of psychology that Mike has that he really brings to the table when he's talking about mindset, and we're talking about mindset in the context of leadership conversations and coaching. Now, um, Kate's going to lead our Q&A today, so I'm going to pass over to you, Kate. Uh, let's uh, let's chat about mindset. Thanks, Caitlin, and thank you, Mike, for joining us today. Can't wait to hear your insights. Um, so I guess we'll start off, you know, start off pretty broad, and then we'll start to to hone in a little bit more. So to begin with, I guess. Can you just talk us through, you know, how important mindset is when it comes to performance? Yes, I can, Kate. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me on this actual session. So I love talking about mindset and um, yeah, unpacking the various different sort of aspects of it. So uh, when it comes to performance, I would say that mindset is absolutely crucial. Um, a, a number of people who've been through GRIST programs would be aware of our model, um, but ultimately how a person thinks determines what it is that they do and what they do or don't do determines the results that they physically get. And if a leader is wanting to improve performance or improve a result, it's not good enough just to want a better result. You've actually got to create some sort of spike or shift in either skill. So teach them something that they, they weren't doing before that they can apply that works better than what they were doing before. That will get you a lift in results. But the other one is mindset. So trying to create some sort of spike in will, desire, drive, motivation, that sort of stuff. And if you do that, you can get a real sort of uh, cut through into results. The interesting thing too, when we talk about, um, say, the psychology of performance and the psychology of success though, is that there's always a certain amount of skill required to do a job. Um, but the idea really is that when it comes to potential success, mindset is up to four to five times more important than skill set to do it. Uh, and what I mean by that is you could have someone who works for you that's the most highly skilled individual you've ever seen. But if you ask them to do something that they fundamentally disagree with as a person, they're just not going to do it. On the flip side, um, you could have someone brand new to your organisation who's never done sort of, or it could be the first time they've done a certain role. But if they join with the right attitude, the right desire, the right will, the right mindset, they often soak up skills like a sponge and get very, very good very, very quickly. Um, so mindset really is, I guess, the gate opener to skill set and, and, and probably the thing that, that impacts results the most. Mm, yeah, okay. And so um, so creating that positive you know mindset in within a team. So what are some ways that we could do that? Yeah, so basically, 
The difference, or probably before I answer that question specifically, the difference between skill set and mindset is skills take time to build. Um, you know, so if you're a leader and you're looking after a team, there's a process in building skill and capability. Mindsets, on the other hand, sort of fluctuate. And you can have times where the mindset of your team is really supporting you, and you can have times where the mindset is not really supporting the direction that you're wanting to go. So it's more transient than skill set is. Um, so leadership or good leadership or good coaching um, is often really about sort of keeping that mindset um, at its optimum for as long as you possibly can. And if you can do that, that's probably the difference between sort of the very best leaders and, and the leaders that are a bit more subject to, to mindset fluctuations and being unable to, to necessarily navigate them. Mm. So a couple of things that, that I think help create a positive mindset in teams. Uh, by the way, I should say the actual mindset starts with you, the leader or the coach. So the first thing is you want to have a, a mindset that's sort of supporting the performance you want to drive. But with your people, probably there's a couple of points. Number one would be really understanding what makes your people tick. So if you can really work out what's important to your people, what, what their values are, what their beliefs are, and if you can align values and beliefs that people already have behind a common goal or vision or direction that you have as a leader, you can get extremely high levels of motivation and discretionary effort coming off the back of it. Um, so the first thing I'd say is understand your people really well. The second thing I'd say is look at what they've responded to historically. So historically, leaders have done, maybe you ran a competition once and everyone got really excited and they got involved and they did it and performance spiked, for example. Look at things that have worked in the past and think about sort of, can you repeat these particular things um, to, to, I guess, support mindset? Um, a third point is trying to coach your people to the point where they detach emotionally from the result that they get and become more interested in the process that they execute. You often find that mindset can be greatly affected by good or bad results that people get. And if they worry too much about the results, then a, then a bad result can mess with their heads, for want of a better word. So if you can encourage more of a focus on, on the actual behaviours that they demonstrate or the process that they execute or the strategy they're delivering versus an attachment to results, that helps as well. And then the last one probably is, and this is probably what suffered the most um, in hybrid working environments, is regular state checks. Like if you think about a, a call centre five years ago, all your people would be there and you could walk up at the start of a shift and see what state they're in and all the rest of it. That has fallen by the wayside a little bit more in the hybrid working environment, but I would certainly recommend daily state checks to maintain the mindset of your team as well. So that's interesting, Mike, and, and thinking about um, mindset across the team and getting that sort of read of state. Um, so how would you know when you're sort of walking around and doing that state check, how do you know when you need to coach around mindset versus that there's a skill issue there? There's probably two answers to that, depending on whether we're talking about a team or an individual. So with a team, um, if you see the team lacking motivation, for example, or if you see a lot of below the line behaviour, like, like teams blaming things or excuse making around things, that's often a pretty good indication that the team might need some sort of mindset intervention, for want of a better word. Mm -hmm. At the individual level, um, there's probably two key ways. So number one would be inconsistency of behaviour. So people do the things that they believe are the right things to do very consistently, if that makes sense. If, however, they do something when you're watching, but they don't do it when you're not, or it's hit and miss in its application, for example, um, we know they've got the skill because we've seen them do it, but if they're not applying it on a, on a regular basis, that's the hallmark of a mindset issue. 
So it's not necessarily someone own, openly resisting you, and they're pretty easy to spot when they do, but it's often that inconsistency of behavioural application that's a bit of a giveaway that you might have a, a, a mindset issue that you want to tackle with that person. Um, uh, off the top of my head, probably one of the last ones that I can uh, think of as well is if you've actually run a few coaching sessions with someone and you've set some goals with them and they've agreed to do things and then you go and look at sort of what it is they've agreed to do and they're not doing it, that would probably be the example of a, of a mindset issue as well. Yeah, great. Uh, well, let's let's dig a little bit further into that. So if, if we're talking about coaching then and coaching around mindset, what really is the difference between coaching around mindset versus, you know, coaching skill set? All right. Um, the first thing I'll say is that coaching skill set is easier than coaching mindset. So there's a bit of an evolution of coaches um, and mindset being probably the pinnacle, if that makes sense. Um, but generally with skill set coaching, skill set coaching revolves around observing someone do something, spotting a skill gap, and then trying to design something that plugs that skill gap and getting people to practice it via repetition uh, until they get good at it and the, and the skill gap closes. So that's the main gist of, of skill set coaching. Mindset coaching is different though. Um, and really what you're trying to do with mindset coaching is uncover the root cause of the performance issue. So there's something causing this performance issue that is not a skill gap. And the art of mindset coaching is being able to dig in and actually work out what that thing is uh, and then be able to address it and, and change perception around it. So I can um, imagine oh, sorry, trying to, yeah, no, sorry, you keep going. Yeah. Go um, so so even, if you, even if you start looking at sort of the behaviours that you use when you're a coach, you need a series of questions really designed to get to the root cause of the person that you're coaching, as opposed to just what's a skill gap that you've got, what do you think you could do differently? You really need to be able to get in there and figure out what the what the problem is. Yeah, okay. So that's what I was about to ask you. So it sounds like it's 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 a, a similar skill to identifying those those um you know skill gaps, um, but a little bit more nuanced. So how do you dig down and really discover that root cause when it's you know it it's not gonna be probably the first response you get from from your um your team member? Well, actually, that's a good point, Kate, because the first response you often get when you start digging in is some form of deflection something that's not necessarily the thing that's really what's causing the problem. But in my experience, the two main um, root causes of mindset issues, they're usually one of these two things. One is a complete lack of awareness um, that the thing is actually an issue, like, like they lack self-awareness around something. Um, they might not agree that there's an actual problem. So they're not, if, if they don't agree that there's an actual issue and they have no awareness around it, they're not going to go and do anything about it. Um, so that would be point one. Um, and if you're ever running into sort of a, a complete lack of awareness, and again, you think about behaviours that coaches do, um, and even if you think about our ACDC coaching model, one of the main things that you really want to be doing if you're dealing with a lack of awareness is you want to be sharing observations. So you need to present evidence that this behaviour is, is causing an issue with an outcome, if that makes sense. So observation um, and, and, and presenting of evidence is very good for dealing with a lack of self-awareness. And then the other one is... Um, asking questions that discuss the link between the behaviour and the outcome, getting the person to really start articulating what are the behaviours they're doing and how does that relate to an outcome and what's the impact that that behaviour or not doing that behaviour has on an outcome. And if they start to see that join between behaviours and outcomes, they start to become aware that there might be something that they need to change. So awareness is the big one. Um, but then the other one is unhelpful beliefs. 
So quite often when you start digging in uh, to what's actually causing this problem and why behaviours aren't happening, you'll find that there's unhelpful beliefs that a person has. So within all human beings, we have helpful versus unhelpful beliefs. And our helpful beliefs help us move forward in life and achieve a whole lot of things. And our unhelpful beliefs get in the way of what we're trying to achieve in life sometimes. If there's anyone on this actual call that thinks they have no unhelpful beliefs in life, that is your unhelpful belief. <laughs> You've definitely got them. They do exist. Um, and, and often if you study emotional intelligence, for example, the whole idea of emotional intelligence is really trying to look at what, what are those unhelpful beliefs that someone has and how can you change them into more helpful beliefs that help you sort of get where you want to go. Um, well, what you will find when you're coaching people is there's usually an, an unhelpful belief that's causing their lack of willingness to do something, and you need to find out what that unhelpful belief is and, and not get sucked into the deflection that they throw out to try and take you you off course. Um, that That's probably one of the main tricks. I, I often see coaches start coaching the deflection versus coaching the actual issue that they're trying to change. Okay, so that's that's a good one to dig into a little bit further there, Mike. I'm 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 certain that we do all have unhelpful beliefs. Give us some examples. What do unhelpful beliefs actually look like so we can recognise them when we're coaching? All right. So a couple of the common ones. Uh, one would be lack of confidence. Someone just doesn't feel like they're able to do something. They don't think they know how to do something. They they have the ability, but they doubt themselves. So lack of confidence is one. Um, uh, you can, you've probably all run into the person that doesn't like change. So change is bad. I don't like change. So if that's an actual unhelpful belief that someone has, it's going to make them quite change resistant. Um, there could be the other unhelpful belief is there could be a lack of belief in the thing you're actually asking them to do. They might not think that that thing that you're asking them to do is is going to change an outcome for the better or anything like that. The other big one's competing beliefs. And I see this a lot in teams, particularly in regulated environments. Um, but an example of a competing belief would be, you could be a leader who's trying to, let's say you're a leader of a call center and you're trying to get people on the phones to have more engaging conversations with their customers. Um, but if that's running into a competing belief like AHT and productivity is the most important thing around here, if they truly believe that, then they're going to see trying to engage with the customer and building rapport with the customer as something that's going to cost them from an AHT perspective. So sometimes you've got this, um, it's not necessarily an unhelpful belief, but it's a competing belief where something else is more important than the thing is that, that you're actually asking them to do. And so I can imagine um, that those sort of unhelpful beliefs um, will be quite diverse throughout your team. And you might find that you know, the whole team or a good portion of the team are having sort of mindset issues, but tackling that root cause unhelpful belief can be quite diverse, right? So. How do we yep. go about addressing that? Well, um, actually, you, you've, you've got me thinking about something separately there too, particularly yeah. around competing and unhelpful or competing beliefs, yeah. is that often, particularly when we talk about teams, often those completed, competing beliefs have come from the experience that they receive from their leaders. So if leaders, for example, keep asking about AHT, 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 then that is what someone will start to really believe is the most important thing here. So part one is probably thinking about, well, what's the, the leadership experience I need to do differently to create a different type of thinking? Because all beliefs are formed from experiences that people receive. So have a look at the general beliefs that your organisation or you as the leader or what have you is giving people. Change a few of those experiences you're giving them. Um, and on a team level, you can certainly start to get some really good cut through. But when it gets down to the individual level, um, you've got to challenge the belief. 
So once you find out what that unhelpful belief is, you use effective questions to really get them thinking about that belief in a way that they haven't thought about it before. So questions that challenge that belief. Um, and then ultimately there's this expression that behavioural change is, is sold, not told, right? So really then you've got to get them to see the value in changing what they're doing after you challenge that belief. So benefits of doing something, um, impacts of not doing things, and when they see the value, when they see benefits outweigh costs of a behavioural change, they will generally go and do something. But it's probably this combination of different leadership experiences, um, challenging the belief with effective questioning, and then solid conversations that demonstrate the value of that behavioural change. Um, and so we've talked about, you know, the coaching, I suppose, the, the mindset of coaching your team and, and their mindset. Um, I guess we haven't really talked so much. We talked, you know, you did touch on it earlier on about the, the actual coach's mindset and going into their, their role and their coaching sessions with the right mindset. So um, what influence does the coach's mindset have on, on, on the team? an enormous influence yeah. and the influence of the coach's mindset on their coaching session is no different to the influence of a frontline staff member's mindset on the customer conversation that they're about to have so again as a coach um, if you lack confidence as a coach it's going to come through when you coach if you've got an unhelpful belief when you coach it's going to come through like, for example, we've got Caitlin and Kate here, right? So if I get it in my head, is let's say they both work for me and I go, well, Caitlin's an extremely difficult person, very hard to get cut through with, really hard to manage. If I believe this, then that comes through in little micro differences in the way that I coach her. Now, if I, on the other hand, think Kate's fantastic, like dream employee, love Kate, so easy to coach, that comes through in little micro differences in my coaching behaviours. And Kate will get the best coaching session that I can deliver because of my mindset, and Caitlin won't. Um, in fact, sometimes if, if I really believe that Caitlin will be really difficult to coach and then I start coaching her, I'm almost reinforcing my unhelpful belief. I'm looking for things um, to sort of prove my beliefs right and all that's getting in the way of a very, very sort of good coaching conversation for Caitlin. So, yeah, the mindset you're in when you're a leader is critical and, and often the unhelpful beliefs that a leader will have will be either about their own ability to do something as a coach or it will be a belief they have about the person that they're going to coach. Um, mm. And if you can sort of remove those unhelpful beliefs, that would be a real sort of step in the right direction so that you can be in the right state of mind to execute a, a very, very good um, coaching conversation when you when you need to. I've even um, just a bit of first-hand experience in that, in that, it almost, I've heard an example of it work the opposite way with a, a, an employee or a team member who was historically fantastic uh, and, and did, was always sort of excelling and performing, you know, very close to the top of, um, of the team each time. And so their coaching sessions were always, oh, yeah, you're doing great. Oh, not much I can say. You're always great. You're always great. And they weren't actually getting the benefit of those coaching sessions because the, maybe the coach was coming into that session going, there's nothing to do there. They're perfect. They're wonderful. They're getting their AHT, their KPIs, and they might have been missing out on those, you know, little bits of, um, you know, coaching wisdom from the, you know, the coach to to keep moving up and up. And so they were kind of plateauing. So it can work both ways. Oh, that's and that's a very interesting um, observation, Kate, too. So um if you think right back to the whole purpose of coaching right the whole idea of coaching is to make someone better at something if you sit down with someone and you just go oh great i didn't see anything that you could improve that was perfect um, yes, you've celebrated that person's success, but you haven't run a coaching session. Mm. You haven't made them any better at something. You haven't improved anything in that person. And 
you'll also see this happen when you start coaching real high performers. So it's easy to coach low performers because there's usually a lot of gaps that you can point your coaching at. But often when you're coaching high performers, they might have a lot of skill. And that's when the coach really needs to make the shift more into mindset coaching conversations mm -hmm. to keep their head in the right place so that they can really keep executing and executing and executing and, and fine tuning that person when they coach them. That's when you're dealing particularly with your top one and two percenters. Mm. So the coach has to find a way to add value and improve performance. And there's various different ways you can do that too as a coach. Yeah, that's an interesting one. That's come up before, Kate. That was a great one to bring up because coaching to high performance is difficult and you sometimes think, oh, well, I don't need to worry about it. But just the fact that they're high performers generally means that they are somebody who really thrives on feedback. So I think it's a it's a beautiful observation there that um, I won't take it personally, Mike, that you find me really difficult to coach. We'll move on. <laughs> that was just an example, Kate. In real life, know, Caitlin's know, an absolute <laughs> pleasure to work with, but uh, as an example. <laughs> <laughs> well, thinking of that and thinking about positive mindset and staying a positive mindset, um, what are some ways that you can then keep that and maintain that positive mindset as a coach to make sure that you are going into your coaching sessions in a really a positive frame of mind? Probably a couple of things, um, and, and they're not necessarily fancy things, but they're just things that you need to do to get into the right frame of mind to deliver a great coaching session. So one would be look at your own helpful and unhelpful beliefs. If you know you've got a couple of unhelpful beliefs, try and change them. Try and find a, a better belief or a more helpful belief about something, and you'll get a, a very a very good outcome. But if we go right back to, oh, this person's a difficult person to coach, you could change the belief too that you have in your head. You know, I can get breakthroughs with anybody. It just means I've got to try a little harder with this person. That would be a more helpful belief than just thinking this person's really difficult to coach. So that would be an example there. Another thing, again, would be focus on, on execution of the process more so than the result. Work on really good quality behaviours when you coach. Um, coaching is often called the art of asking questions. Find great questions. Concentrate on crafting great questions and your coaching sessions will go brilliantly. Uh, the third one would be have goals and visions that excite and motivate you. It's hard for you to be in a positive frame of mind if you're not inspired by the vision that you're sort of trying to get people behind. And then probably the least interesting but one of the most important ones is the physical aspects of mindset. Um, and in particular, that's things like movement and exercise and sleep, like get three hours sleep a night for seven nights in a row and see how good you are when you go and coach your person. Um, so there's real there's a real just a looking after yourself um, aspect to it, if that makes sense to uh, to bring your best self to, to work or to a coaching conversation. All right. Um, thank you, Mike. Um, we've reached the point with uh, we're looking for some audience questions. And I do have one in the chat already, which I'll get to in a second. But please, if you do have questions for Mike, probably because there's quite a big group of us, if you wouldn't mind popping it in the chat, that would be the easiest way for us to then get it across to Mike. Um, but and, Mike, and actually, before they do too, Caitlin, yeah. I'd love to, I'd like to say as well, I don't think I've ever spoken for half an hour straight without actually asking <laughs> a question or taking a question. So yeah, I'd love... If anyone's got questions to ask, please get in there, fire away, yeah. and yeah. Be awesome. Um, well, we've been talking a lot about mindset and positivity and, and, and working towards a positive mindset. The question I've got here is, when it comes to coaching through vulnerability, do you have any tips to juggle being vulnerable or acknowledging someone's mindset not being quite there yet without coming across as, you know, not being aligned with their mindset? Um, so thinking about vulnerability and coaching through vulnerability of mindset, knowing that they're not quite there yet. What are your tips there, Mike? All right, now there's vulnerability and there's vulnerability, okay, is the first thing that I would say. Um, so sometimes vulnerability can be an actual um, well-being or even mental health issue. So something like that, you have to sort of realise that there are proper professionals that help with that. They're usually in HR and, and you need to seek help and advice and support if you're running into that. But if the vulnerability or the other thing that often causes vulnerability um, 
is again a sort of a lack of self-esteem like i don't know if you've ever coached people who lack self-esteem where you know they're actually a bit bit better than what they know they are but it makes them lack confidence they they feel vulnerable and all the rest of it one of the real tricks when working with people who do lack self-esteem that causes this feeling of vulnerability is the way that self-esteem builds is by doing things you didn't think you could do and getting a win, like pulling off something that you didn't think you could do and it worked. And then that little bit of confidence grows and that little bit of confidence grows and that little bit of confidence grows. So if I'm coaching someone like that, what I'm trying to do is really small chunk the behavioural change into a really little step um, that, that with some coaching and support and practice and help from me, I want them off the back of this coaching session to just try something really small and get a little bit of a win. And when they get that win, that, that confidence grows, that vulnerability reduces a little bit. But you've got to keep that pattern going if that makes sense little win little win little win little win until they become sort of um quite confident in what they're doing um but they often won't do this themselves naturally that's why they need a coach to really break that that behavioral change into tiny little pieces and support them on their way to getting their wins I love that. That's a, a really nice way to end. Now, I don't have any other questions, but please don't be shy and do um, pop some in. If you're having any trouble with the chat, do put your hand up and um, we can go to you uh, verbally if that's easier for you as well. So please let us know if you've got other questions. But I think that pretty much wraps up um, our webinar for today. Um, it was, we've got a few notes saying how terrific that is. Oh, I do have some more questions. One second. Um, differences between coaching and feedback, Mike, how do they best work together or how do you distinguish between coaching and feedback? That's a, that's a great question yep. for you. So both work best off the back of observation. That's the first thing that I'd say. Um, I, I much prefer feedback and coaching after the, the, the coach has seen something. But if you look at the main difference between the two, obviously, obviously there's conversational differences, right? But I think the most important thing is the difference in intent. The intent of feedback is raising awareness. That's why you give people, or, or to celebrate a win. So you're either celebrating something that someone's done, or you're trying to give them feedback to raise awareness around something. Coaching is about raising capability and performance. So, you, so, so for example, I sometimes see coaching sessions that really only deliver the intent of feedback. So there's a whole lot of questions around what someone should do differently. But if they don't practice that stuff, if they don't do something to improve its um, its ability to happen, then they haven't actually improved the capability of the person. So a good coaching session for me has both. They raise awareness and they improve capability, whereas feedback alone is more about raising awareness or celebrating successes, but doesn't necessarily have to improve capability. That's a good answer. You can kind of have feedback in the coaching, but not um, not the other way around. It's a it, they go definitely interlinked, which is um, and so important both of them when you're thinking about mindset issues. I guess. Yeah, absolutely. That. Um. Well, uh, thank you, Mike. Really appreciate you jumping on and having the discussion with us today. It was a terrific, very well rounded and very detailed um, discussion around mindset and particularly mindset in coaching. And we've talked a lot about that today and, and all the different sorts of behaviours that you can demonstrate when you are coaching to mindset, which brings me to the little point of our webinar where we do uh, talk a little bit about ACDC, which is our coaching model at risk that we use. And some of those things that, that Mike has mentioned today, the, the series of questions to raise awareness that are lining back to values and an overarching goal, um, just creating an, creating an understanding or building that understanding around what your desired behaviours could be to get those desired results, all those really important things, are all part of our ACDC model. Um, and just to give you a little quick overview of ACDC, 
Uh, ACDC is a simple behavioural framework that really boosts your leadership conversations uh, while it still allows you to coach in your own style. So you can see it's got four phases here. A lot of you will be really familiar with this model. You may be using it already. Um, four phases, and then under each of those phases, there are five micro behaviours. And these micro behaviours are those tiny moments that really ensure that your coaching conversations are effective in driving that behavioural change that you want to see and those tangible performance outcomes. So whether you're coaching to skill or whether you're coaching to, to will around that mindset, the behaviours are really flexible to allow you to get into that deep questioning and get to that kind of desired state that you want to get to with your coachee to then set those commitments that are actually going to show a, a real commitment to behavioural change going forward. Um, that brings me to the gist by grist. Now, the GIST by GRIST, and again, some of you may have seen the GIST by GRIST before. The GIST by GRIST is our online coaching platform where you can actually learn ACDC uh, online in your own time, however you'd like to learn it. Now, our GIST platform takes you through the full ACDC tactical leadership model. You can learn all the phases, all the micro behaviours, and you learn them all through really short, sharp, funny videos. And you can see our, our good friend Shane Jacobson is in most of those videos, joined um, with uh, Pia Miranda and a couple of other comedians as well. Uh, these videos are really then cemented through anchoring activities and then applying your skill in real life because we know that, that coaching is only good once you get to actually coach in real life. Um, ACDC Online through the GIST really helps you then take all of those behaviours through ACDC and apply them into your own coaching and just start that journey of self-assessment about how you can really assess how your own coaching is contributing to the behavioural change you want to see across your team. Um, so that's it for me for today on the spruik for ACDC and the GIST. Um, but I really want to throw out another huge thank you to Kate and to Mike uh, for the discussion today and for the questions. And, um, and a huge thank you for all of you for jumping on on a Monday morning and joining us on a uh, coaching webinar about mindset. Really terrific to see uh, so many people here today. And by all means, if you have some follow up questions for us or something that you didn't quite get to in the session, please email them through to us uh, here at Grist um, or email them through to Kate, Mike or myself uh, or join, uh, join us on, the, uh, on our website. You can also subscribe to our newsletter. We can get tons of information about um, what we're up to at Grist. And um, this recording will be available as well. And Kate will be sending out a, uh, a link to all of you who have joined us today so you can watch the recording again. And feel free to share this across uh, your network or share it with whoever you think might um, find this valuable. But huge thank you and lovely to see you and looking forward to seeing you all on our next webinar. Thank you and have a lovely week ahead. Thanks, everyone. See you later. Thank you. Thank you.